So I don't know if you can hear me, but is UBVRI your, uh, do you do uh, photometry and uh, <laughs> different color bands? Yes, yeah, somehow that's not coming through. Not I don't like poached eggs. Really? Eh? No, the yolks are still runny. Oh, you don't like uh, runny yolks? Don't like yeah. runny eggs. Well, the meeting has started. Ah, sorry, I won't disturb you. Well, I'll be quiet. I'll go outside. We'll keep an eye on uh, what the schedule that's is. Something, that's something I'll be doing in uh, rehab, right? But the Zoom meetings, yeah. Zoom meetings, yeah. Okay. I look at your tablet or your laptop. Here we go. Hey, can anybody can anybody hear me? Yes. Yes. All right, how's the volume sound? Too loud, too low. A little no, bit just low. right. Just right. A little bit low. All right. So I noticed that uh, we're, we'll get started here in a minute. We're, we're not quite ready. Um, 
but I noticed that a number of people were trying to join the meeting for the last couple of hours. And just a reminder, all the times on the agenda are for the Pacific time zone, Western US. So for those of you who've been trying to join and were frustrated that nothing was going on for the last couple of hours, just please check, check your time zones. And um, so we don't have uh, that, that confusion for the afternoon session and for tomorrow. Okay, so, um, all right, so I think we're we're set. So I'll just start off by by thanking uh, Dan Gray and uh, Gary and Marion here at TMS for setting up this wonderful space for us in their shop to have the meeting. This is the the new location for TMS, but it feels almost exactly the same as the old. And uh, and uh, they've gone to a lot of effort on uh, on their own part to to get this ready for us. And thank you very much. Um, it's it's really quite wonderful. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, to start off, I just have a, a few comments. Um, this is the 16th annual Alt Dev's Workshop, and um, there is a at least one year, maybe two. Uh, one we missed because of COVID, um, and maybe we missed another one for another reason. I, I don't recall. But this is the 16th one we've actually had. You know, we have, as if you've looked at the uh, the agenda, we have some very interesting um, presentations today. Um, and the theme that has just organically grown seems to be mostly mirror testing. That's the uh, the main thing, which is really interesting, I think, because uh, for those who are are maybe just slightly informed about mirror testing, the Foucault test is probably the thing that comes to mind, or the Ronke test. Well, there's more than those ways to to test mirrors, and we'll be finding out about that today. Um, now, through today and tomorrow, I like to challenge everyone here and out there in Zoom land to think about how you'd like to see this workshop evolve going into the future, starting next year, let's say. Um, I've been doing, I've been the chair for this workshop since 2011, which really shocked me when I counted back to see how long I've been doing this. And um, it, it's time to shake things up. You know, we're We've been doing the same format, the same type of thing each year, which has been good, but perhaps we can do better. Um, and uh, I'd like to to say that, you know, through conversations I've had with Mel, Mel Bartels, um, um, he has agreed to become co-chair starting next year, uh, which, um, which I'm real excited about. You know, Mel is one of those people in, in our small ATM community who, who needs no introduction, so I won't. <laughs> but I will say that our conversations have really been productive and invigorating. Yeah. And I've enjoyed them very much. Um, and we're excited to hear about suggestions and ideas from everyone who's participated in, in, in our workshops this weekend and in past workshops. What, what would you like to see? What do you think would work to, to add, to delete, to change things up? And, and just to be clear, you know, with Mel becoming co-chair, that's a huge upgrade for this workshop, in my opinion. Frankly, I try to convince him to just be the chair, take it over. Um, you know, who is better qualified? <clears throat> but the uh, best I could do is co-chair, but that's that's a big upgrade right there. So. Um, I'm real excited because, you know, I'm okay, but he's Mel Bartels. So, you know, enough said. So I, I'm, I'm confident that he'll be a driving force in this workshop going forward. And sh surely by coincidence, he's our first speaker. So Mel, if you're there and you're ready to share your screen, let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. Can you all hear me okay? Oh, yes. okay. We need to turn up our volume here on the monitor. Okay. Oh. Okay. Dan, Dan's taking care of it. 
Okay, can you we, hear we me just, now? Just so you know, we have a brand new monitor for display here in the workshop that was just unpacked this morning. Okay, say thanks, something. Thanks to Gary. Thanks to Gary. Okay, so, say something, Mel. So can you hear me now? Oh, that's better, yes. Okay. It must be a huge monitor because of the angle that you're looking way up. Yeah, it is a big one. <laughs> Well, Howard, with that introduction, I'm kind of speechless. Uh, running an organization for 12 years is no small feat, and uh, we all surely appreciate. But it's a lonely pursuit, as you know. So getting new ideas. I think the alt as conference going back so many years, uh, starting with Russ Janay, really his main driving idea was to get people together who are interested in innovating and see what we could come up with. The theme ostensibly was to make one to two meter scopes inexpensive and affordable for small institutions and colleges who are looking to do their own research and also to attract students. But, um, you know, maybe it's time to move on to uh, themes that interest us as amateurs. So, can you enable screen sharing, Howard? Yeah, I thought I did. Okay, share. Okay, try that. So you're sharing your screen, but you're not sharing it out to where I can share my screen. Ah, all right. We'll stop that. Click on no. Click on go to security, actually. You're going to need to do this anyway. Go to security. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then enable the screen sharing. Yeah. Right at the... Right, allow participants to the very first thing on the top there. Share screen. Game. Yeah. All right, try it again. There we go. <laughs> All right. So, can you see my screen now? That says yes, we can. Great. And I think I detect the voice of Rob Brown in the background. How many people are there in person? Oh, I'd say we got about a dozen. Oh, excellent. All right, well, I'll begin. Hi, everyone. Mel Bartels, zooming to you from beautiful Central Oregon, where it is incredibly blue, and the mountains are glistening white, and the moon and Venus last night and this morning were just so bright. But there is a price. It was 14 degrees Fahrenheit this morning. Hopefully that so, will happen. So my presentation is Rocky Unchained, and the scope is born, ostensibly two separate subjects, but actually they're connected. And they're connected in the sense that I devise mirror making processes, for instance, pedal apps. And I need to test these processes to iterate, to improve, and also to adjust them for the mirror that I am applying them to. So I have developed several software enhanced Rocky versions that uh, I think no, no. I find uh, quite useful. And I do that for the satisfaction of building a new scope. But that isn't where it ends for me. I want to observe through the new scope and see what new objects I can see with it. And when you see the Andromeda twist or rediscover the Pleiades bubble, or you see integrated flux nebula, which are galactic cirrus, clouds of dust and gas that float way above our galaxy, for the first time, it's a transcendent experience. And in fact, psychiatrists interviewing astronauts returning to Earth have coined a phrase for it called the overlook effect. And they estimate that you need to see several hundred stars in a striking setting for this feeling of awe and connection to occur. But it's not just stars, it's galaxies and nebulae that will do it too. Here's my drawing of M3 through the 30 inch. For some reason, I find M3 particularly beautiful, even prettier than M13. Although to be fair, they both pale in comparison to the monstrous Omega Centauri cluster. And there's an integrated flux nebula to the side of it for those with enough light throughput and field of view to where you can see these uh, really faint 
uh, nebulosities that are all through the sky. For instance, uh, here's the Draco triplet, three really interesting clusters. I think that, uh, I guess it's the size that is so striking. Uh, there's a whole series of smaller galaxies around them too. And they too are embedded in integrated flux nebula. <laughs> my, my cat now is doing the typical uh, Zoom cat interruption. <laughs> All right, so uh, the supernova in M101, a galaxy that seems to produce a lot of them. There's all sorts of galaxies in the field, an integrated flux nebula. I found this uh, really inspiring to see too. Here's uh, NGC 4216 with the tidal stream. A smaller galaxy is being stretched and pulled apart as it's being pulled into the main galaxy here. We know that this is how the Milky Way has been built because we can now measure stars and their vectors, and we see that our galaxy is composed of multiple streams of stars. Here's a particularly deep observation. It's looking at the sombrero, and I noticed the IFN. So later I discovered that there's actually a halo uh, tidal stream around the sombrero itself. And uh, if you can see my mouse, this is the embedded stream within, and that surrounds Sombrero in 104, and then here, over here is the IFN. All right, so the reason that I have these new sites is that I'm trying to build new scopes, and for quite a while now, I have settled into pursuing this idea of thin and fast and uh, meniscus-shaped mirrors, um, leading me to better observations. Um, they're near instant thermal equalizing. They're lightweight, don't need a ladder because they're so fast. In fact, I've come up with two maxims for myself, um, no thicker than 3 fourths of an inch and no slower than F3. For those who have not looked through these scopes, I would say get the to a uh, fast meniscus mirror scope as soon as possible, seeing as believing. And if I hadn't looked through them, I, I could be skeptical too, but wow, the views are really something. Well, is it a surprise, is it any wonder that the processes that we have learned that we use on standard fat mirrors don't necessarily work on thin meniscus mirrors? So that's what I've been working on and investigating. So for example, uh, way back in the early 80s when I first built a 24 inch after looking through John Dobson's 24 inch, it weighed about 350 pounds, it required a 10 foot ladder. And my current big scope is a 30 inch, it weighs 100 pounds. It's a ladderless scope, although sometimes I need a step up on a step stool. Um, if I'm downhill of the scope. And um, a 14 inch scope that I built in the early 70s, weighed 200 pounds, has turned into this uh, 16 inch scope that weighs 22 pounds, highly portable. So as an amateur mirror maker, um, I strive to make the mirror as good as I possibly can until I can make no further progress on it, given my current skill set. I then build the scope for it, and I go out and enjoy it, and I forget all about making the mirror and whatever travails I had, and uh, so on and so forth, until the next mirror comes along, and then I go back into mirror making mode. Um, as good as I possibly can, what do I mean by that? It's the idea that um, whatever deviation or error I'm trying to fix, another error of similar amplitude or impact on the image occurs. And that's just as best as I can. And I accept that and I enjoy it for what it is. So these thin, fast meniscus mirrors um, demand quality. Um, you can't add the quality afterwards. You can't uh, tweak collimation as the sky darkens. It has to be built in to the process of making the mirror and the scope. For example, I control uh, stigmatism by adopting the process. 
that keeps astigmatism from ever happening. Um, in this situation, I use mirror on top of full-size tool. The pitch lap supports the mirror. Uh, I try to keep the mirror surface smooth and I keep it evenly parabolized as I move along the process. Um, I've given up collimating. I build my scopes with built-in collimation. Adjustments are just there to become unadjusted and valuable time under the beautiful dark skies is the last time, the last moment when you want to be adjusting these. And sometimes you can adjust them quickly and other times they come apart on you and you spend forever getting them back together. So I just don't collimate my scopes anymore. I build the collimation in. You know, why do you have adjustments? Um, I use uh, three axis motion so I can get smooth uh, motions near the zenith. So I try to build quality into everything I do. Hey, uh, Mel. <clears throat> yes. Um, can you uh, can you go back? To, can you go back a slide? I wanted to know. I I think some people might not want to know. You know, forward a little bit. Uh, one more. Uh, the second to last one. Can you describe what you mean by three axis double flex rocker? I think most people know, but maybe some don't. Ah. So let's look at this 16 inch down here. It's a three axis mount. It's aimed toward the horizon right now. And when I sit in the observing chair, whether the scope is up at zenith or pointed downward, and I grab the upper end and I move the scope, it naturally moves up and down in altitude and back and forth in azimuth. That's the standard Dobsonian design. Everyone's familiar with that. Well, when you get the scope right next to Zenith, uh, the motions are not so convenient anymore. Um, instead, you have to grab the upper end and rotate the scope in azimuth, and that rotates the view. And sometimes if you need to be just on the other side of the Zenith, you actually have to rotate the scope the whole 180 degrees. So what I've done is incorporate a second rocker at 90 degrees to the first rocker. And this um, allows me to move the scope in altitude, altitude. So I can push the scope away from me and I can push the scope up and down. So the combination of all three axes put together with the double flex rocker is what I mean by three axis motion. So does that help explain? Yeah. So it's best experienced in person. And you can see the natural transition from altitude azimuth to altitude altitude as the scope moves upward. Well, hold on, I gotta do something about my point. What's going on? Ah, uh, yes, our pets. Okay. All right, so I making a quality statement that I've discovered with these mirrors that you can't add quality in later. You can't tweak the service. You have to build it in from the start. Otherwise, it's just a hopeless mess of deviations and errors that you will never get a hold of. So um, the rocking calculator, uh, I need a test that quickly identifies the greatest deviation from ideal, has to be simple, quick, and repeatable. So I've come up with software enhancements that I call the matching rocking the uh, unwrap or deparabolizing rocky, the rocky band and the rocky grid. So here's my rocky tester. It's a very simple affair, a grading with the uh, lines or bands oriented vertically. Light goes through the bottom, reflects off the mirror, comes back through the top, and you can see a uh, part of a mirror here. If I want to analyze the image, the Rocky Graham later, I just simply hold the smartphone up behind the tester and uh, snap a picture. This is what the picture looks like. I can then paste it into my software. This is my finished 16 inch. So let me see if I can uh, give you a demonstration of this. So first of all, I'm going to come over to here. Um, can you all see this uh, Rocky Graham here? Yeah. Great. Okay, so I'm going to copy that to the yeah. clipboard. And I'm going to come over here. 
Here's my Ronky software. Uh, it just runs in a browser. I've already pre-entered the diameter 20.2. The radius of curvature is 117.5. But if you don't know that, if you know the focal ratio, just enter that. Or if you know the focal length, you just enter that. The other two will be calculated for you. The grading. Uh, I'm using a 65 lines per inch grading. Now you have to be careful. There's a got you here. What I mean by lines per grading is how many bands there are per inch. Uh, I'm in an imperial here. If you're in metric, it'd be per millimeter, three or four uh, lines per millimeter. However, some manufacturers count a band as two, and that's because they're counting the transitions from light to the dark band, and then on the other side from the dark band back to the transparent white. So the only way to know for sure is to get out your ruler and a magnifying lens and begin counting bands. However, uh, in the unwrap portion, um, it turns out you don't even need to know the grading uh, frequency at all. You can skip that. So um, I've entered a grading offset. Um, I just happen to know that that number's about right. And um, so that you don't have to enter these values over and over again, you can save the data with the name and retrieve it in future sessions. So I'm going to attempt to post or paste in this image. There we go. Can you see the paste in an image? Yeah. OK, so you can see that um, I guessed kind of close to what it is, but it's not exact. So I'm going to go up here to the slider and adjust the radius of curvature until I find the best fit. And there we are. It's not a great fit, particularly on this side here. It looks like I didn't quite get the rocky gram centered. So I'll uh, try to center it up a little bit. But oh, here we go. Um, my bands and the um, computer predicted bands don't quite agree. And in fact, you can see here on the unwrap that they kind of curve inward, which means that the mirror is not fully parabolized. But it's pretty close. So I'm going to go up here to the parabolic correction. And I'm going to enter 9.5. I think it's just undercorrected a little bit. Okay, now it's looking closer. And then I'll adjust the radius of curvature just a little bit here. There we go. And so that's the match. So you can simply look over here on the left side and see that it's not exact. But over here, somehow uh, the bands have become straight. So I realized one night that whatever algorithm I'm using to calculate these bands can be used on a real life image to stretch it back out such that if the mirror is perfectly parabolized, the bands would be straight. So I'm gonna increase the transparency to one. And so here we go. And they're kind of straight. Uh, this is, happens to be my 20 inch that's in progress right now. Uh, this is my 10th session uh, that I concluded yesterday afternoon. I started Monday, today is Saturday, so I've done five days, two sessions a day. And I'm at this point here, I'm about 95% corrected, and I'm kind of lagging a little bit. So where, and because the bands curve inward, I know that this is slightly undercorrected. So what zone might this be when it's stretched out? So I'm going to turn on the bands here. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, see if I can make them a different color. There we go. And I need to um, lower the transmission for the bands to come in. OK, so 75% band over here, 50%. 25% is here. Look where the 75% zone is on the uh, unwrapped Rocky. It's way down here. And you go, whoa, what's happening here? Well, the parabolic distortion of a fast mirror is uh, very much so in its outer zones. And in fact, the outer zones of the mirror contribute a great deal of light to the image. And the slope of the light coming in has to be critically controlled. And so this is why this image here is so big in the outer zones. And you can see uh, around 
it sways inward and comes back out. So this tells me that somewhere between 75 and 100%, the mirror is undercorrected, relatively speaking. Okay, so um, if I get curious, I can see just how much deviation there is, and I can use my zonal errors table. So first, I'm gonna update the zones to the rocky band positions. There we are. This will help me when I adjust a zone, it'll directly affect the band, and it's just easier to see what's going on. Secondly, I know from this picture here that somewhere between 75 and 100% inch is undercorrected. So I'm going to have to here. Oh, oh, let me uh, back up a little bit. Um, it's 95% correction up here. So I need to pass that into the table. So I'm going to say reset corrections to parabolic. There we go. And then I'm going to set the transparency back to one just to make it easier to see. Okay, so the 95% has been passed in here just for convenience's sake. And whoa, what's going on over here? Well, you know, when you focus the scope, you do the best you can and you try to get all the light into one focus. This is clearly not the situation here. So I'm going to adjust this by adding just a tiny bit of offset radius to curvature. Oh, here we go. Now I happen to play with that ahead of time. So uh, you put in a number here and now the center and the edge are pretty close. This is a wave error of one on the mirror surface. So on the mirror surface, I'm about a quarter wave, which means at focus, I'm about a half wave off. Doesn't really matter because the criteria of the light rays all passing through the area disk, not even close. So this image would look bloated and unfocusable at the eye. But I'm curious as to what I need to do in here, in this zone that's under corrected. So as I said, it was between 75 and 100%. So let's take this zone here, um, the 0.83 zone. And because it's under corrected, I'm going to have to add correction to compensate for it. So there we go. I straighten it up a little bit. And I'm probably going to have to do that for the surrounding zones. That strengthens it a bit. And uh, I'll do that down here. Uh, that's almost too much. So we'll bring it back to the 95. Maybe this zone needs to go all the way up a little bit more. OK, so that's straighter up here now. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And let's compare it to the image before the correction. So I'll just turn off everything. There it is, the raw rocky gram coming in. And there it is with my zonal adjustment. So pretty close, but not perfect. But I'm not looking for perfection here. I'm just looking to see um, what the mirror surface profile looks like. And sure enough, it shows me that between the 75 and 100% zones, I need to get that mirror surface down, and then I need to taper into the edge. And that's the value of this right here. It tells me what to do um, directly with the mirror. OK, so that's how I use the Rocky and the matching and the unwrap, the deparabolizing of it, if you will. So let me go back to my presentation. So what kind of criteria are we looking at? Well, um, I'm just looking on big, fast mirrors to get within a quarter wave, because I'll use a star test to finish off the mirror. So what is a quarter wave error? Well, you should be able to see this difference here if you're looking carefully. And on a 12 inch F5, you can see this difference. Worst case, on a big fast mirror where you have adjusted the mirror uh, center and edge to coincide, the 70% zone will be off. This is a quarter wave deviation. So it's pretty close, but if you look closely, very closely, you can clearly see that. So let's look at some examples. Here's an AstroScan mirror that was measured to 1 6 wave the interferometer. I matched it up, but notice in here, the bands still curve inward. So this mirror is a sixth wave under corrected. So that's pretty good accuracy. That's what I'm looking for. Now, you have to be careful when you do the unwrap and you're outside the radius of curvature where the bands curl like this. Look at this band right here. This is actually the same band 
This part of the band here wraps around the backside and overlays with this. And you can see that here when I put the alphabet across this. This happens to be my 25-inch um, f2.6 mirror in progress. This wasn't the finished picture. And you can see right where the wraparound occurs, that's where this begins and just where this ends. And then this part up here looks very strange. It's kind of like upside down and inverted. So um, I've played around with different display options. The best is I give you a bullseye, a bullseye option. You either have it off or turn it on, which shows you the backside of the wraparound, if you will. This part right here is actually the mirror's edge. And this part is the part where it wraps around. So just to be aware of that. So what I try to do on the unwrap is get uh, Rocky Grams from the inside of the Lucy Overture. However, I've devised a quicker test where I don't have to go through that at all. If you go back to my software, you see this business here, Rocky Bands cross the center at these numbers here. So I prepare a tape here, and I put it across the mirror's face, and I simply walk back to the Rocky tester and I look through it, and I adjust it to get the bands as close as possible. So there's no picture taking, there's no analysis. You simply put the band across the mirror and you take a look. If the bands are short, you need more polishing. And sure enough, here we are around the 75, 87% zones, and you can clearly see that the bands are considerably short. Well, that's that error that we saw in the uh, mirror profile analysis. Same thing on, on the other side here. So this is what I do most of the time. Put the tape on, I see which uh, zones need more. That way I can spend my time thinking about what is going to be my a pitch lamp and stroke strategy to uh, make the mirror better. I also added a two-dimensional uh, grid factor to this too. And here's when you turn the grid on and then here's what it looks like if it's unwrapped. Here's my 13 inch. Now there's, uh, ideally you would get a grid grading, but if you're careful not to move the tester, you clamp it down, you can just rotate the grady by 90 degrees, take a second Rocky gram, add it to the first one, push it into the software, and you get this. And everything should line up if the mirror is looking good. Here's my 25 inch in progress on the left hand side with the poor man's or poor person's grid grading. And you can just look at it. You can see that it's high here little bit of a low center, it's low down here, and it's got a high edge. When the mirror is finished, this is what it looked like. So the grid can be useful. And indeed, it turns begins to turn the Rocky into a Hartman version, or what you might call a Hartman Rocky test. One thing I'll say, uh, you notice that that um, outer zone in the uh, 25 inch is low here. Uh, Avoid low zones. When the mirror overcorrects, that low zone becomes really stand outish in the start test. So, what low zones do on mirrors is they actually narrow the uh, thermal control zone that that mirror can be in before you begin to get an objectionable start test. So, try to avoid low zones. All right. Excuse me, by low zone, do you mean overcorrected? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, these terms are all relative. You can find a radius, a curvature where that zone isn't low anymore. But when I say low, I mean looking through here where you have balanced the best as you can, and then this, this squeezes in, that's a low zone. Or an underparabolized. Or if you want to be absolute about it, you'd say that just zones, radius of curvature is not as long as it needs to be. Okay, now all of this is because I'm a big advocate that um, if you're going to do quality, you need to do more than one test. So I always follow up with the start test because there were too many times earlier in my mirror making career uh, when I got surprised by the start test after the mirror was illuminated. So if you do the star test, you know exactly what you're getting. 
And it's no surprise. And today I silver my mirrors, but you know, why strip the coating and refigure it's kind of a downer. So uh, so two tests, uh, Ronke with the full call, Ronke with the Hartman, Ronke with the slit test, or whatever combination you'd like to do. Okay, so let's move on then to um, the second part of my talk. The 16 inch, this is what it is. Um, you sit in a chair, it's just a fabulous scope. There is no equilibration time. Only once did I see the mirror star test exhibit the slightest, slightest bit of overcorrection of eye power. I went back and opened up this passage net. And by the time I came back and sat down in the chair and looked through the eyepiece, the mirror was corrected. So I walked back and closed the vent. I mean, these mirrors are ready to go from the moment you take them out. 300 power, no problem. And in fact, I was at a recent star party here, had bigger scopes in mind, had high-end large um, ED refractors, and the scope that gave the best image of Saturn all night long was this 16-inch right here, and it's because of thermal. The refractor was still um, undergoing thermal cool down of its lens. Um, the bigger scopes were still struggling to go catch up with the temperature drop that was going on, but the 16 was just right there. And looking at Saturn, uh, I was very pleased that everyone congregated around my scope at the end. It's just a uh, one and a half a degree um, field of view. The entire scope weighs 22 pounds. It sits on, on a seat in the car. Uh, the mirror took about two to three months. And because I want to share uh, this, Tom Otbos, David Davis have made similar mirrors. Um, we started this idea of an online mirror making place. This is how the skull folds up so it can sit um, in, in the car, carry it around like this. Um, here's what the mirror looks like at John. <laughs> And when I say that I build in collimation, I don't have any more adjustments. This is how I do it when I'm building the upper end. I put in the laser collimator and I have it uh, aim at a target across the way. When I put the diagonal in, I have a jig to hold the diagonal in precise alignment. Once I wire it up and pull the jig off, that's it. I don't touch it again. I want to acknowledge uh, David Davis um, for his um, first large thin fast meniscus mirror back in 2005. Uh, I didn't think it was possible to do this, but the first glance through the eyepiece, I realized, my gosh, this could actually work. So hats off to uh, David for showing uh, what I thought was impossible could be done. So um, back to this whole business of why I do it, the transcendence and the awe. Here's, um, NGC 147 and 185 companion galaxies to Andromeda um, as seen through the 16 inch. And you can see that there are streaks of IFM interlaced through the field of view. And the two galaxies, companion galaxies themselves, are quite different from each other. So I find this a striking view. So the Pleiades bubble is this uh, conglomeration of nebulosity right around the Pleiades. But looking through the 16 inch, I found these puffs and they seem to suggest that there is a, a larger outer bubble. I've got about two thirds of it drawn here. I haven't gotten around to uh, observing the rest. Actually it takes quite a while to make these drawings. And um, so That's yeah. That's a huge area of sky, Mel, yeah. Yeah, it's a massive view, uh, 15 degrees or so. And I'm using a 16 inch scope to do this. All right, so my current project is this 20 inch. And um, uh, why am I doing a 20 inch after I did a 16? Well, I'd originally gotten a 20 inch blank, but the blank failed. And then Rob Brown got me in on a deal to get to 16. So I started to 16 and then the replacement 20 came. So I'm just getting around to doing the replacement 20. It's actually this black vitrified ceramic glass. It's my seventh, uh, Fast mirror is three-fourths of an inch thick. It's just massively thick for me. I don't know what your perspective is. And um, so here I am. Um, my first parabolization attempt How is going I'm on my second attempt. This is where I had the first one. It's ready for the star test. And somehow I got a bit of grit in there and switched the glass. 
Yeah. 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 Excuse me, Mel. Can you uh, pause for a moment? Yeah. Uh, could, uh, someone oh, yeah. out in, in Zoom uh, has your microphone on and we can hear your conversation. Yeah. So if you're watching on Zoom, please mute yourself. Do I have a dinner awake? Yeah. Hello. We're hearing about your dinner plans. We'll catch up on so food. I'm going to uh, mute you. <laughs> and they go up here. Yeah. Uh oh. You know. There you go. And then unmute Mel. Yeah. Okay. Find Mel and get him unmuted. There you go. Okay. Okay, Mel. You might have to right. unmute yourself. All right. So with that, thank you. Nice little Zoom interruption. Yeah. So um, I'm telling the story how I had the 20 inch ready for start testing, and then I switched it. And I couldn't sleep that night. And I decided I just couldn't stand looking at the mirror for the rest of my life with those scratches in that one corner of the mirror. So I polished out the scratches. Yes, scratches can be polished out, just takes a little time. The worst part of all though, is that when you polish out to remove scratches, a heavily parabolized mirror, you end up with a mirror with a severe turned down edge. And I mean, massively severe, like you've never seen before. So that actually took more time to polish out than the scratch did. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Monday, five days ago, I started parabolizing this mirror. And uh, here's where it looks like now. It's not quite ready for the star test, but we just went through the analysis of this mirror and I'm pondering what to do next to it. Or I know what to do, but how to go about doing it. So that's what I'm working on now. Uh, the idea it will be more of a souped up 16, um, but the 16 turned out so superlatively um, it's quite a uh, target for the 20 to get to, so we'll see. Uh, one of my 20 inches from back in the day, 150 pounds, F5, what the 20 inch will turn into, I haven't thought about it yet, but it'll be something. Oops. Okay, almost done to the end. Then after that, my way will be clear to work on the 242s. As I discovered with the 30s, getting a second mirror to tag along, as long as you do to the second mirror, everything you do to the first mirror, and that can really hurt you when you realize that you did something bad with the first mirror, and now you've got to do it a second time to the second mirror. But you do that all in service that the second mirror is always slave to the first one. So if you can figure out the first one, the second one comes along for mirror three. The problem with the 42s is that here's the flex in the 25 and 30, and it's just massive compared to uh, smaller mirrors. And the 42s are just off the charts. So. However, uh, a vinyl 42 would be the way of me uh, being able to realize my long decades dream of uh, breaking the one meter barrier, something Steve Swayze and I used to uh, brainstorm over, and sadly he's no longer with us. Or maybe I'll end up breaking my back and you'll see me you know, in the hospital bed or something. So um, to end then on the awe and transcendence, Recently, on the astronomical photo of the day, someone posted a picture of the Western Veil with this really faint dust cloud next to it. And I just thought, oh, there I go again. The number of times I've looked at the veil and I haven't looked just beyond it. Didn't think there'd be anything there. Here's a mosaic I did of the veil with the 25 five years ago. And I did capture a little bit of this out here. Um, but I just thought it was part of the veil. And like I say, I missed the chance. So I went back to the 30 inch with its degree field of view and I settled in to try to see this. And it's actually a pretty viewable nebula. Um, you can see it break apart into two parts. It's not that dim. It has this cute little feature that comes down here, extensions that come off here. And there's more to it that go beyond the field of view, but that's what I managed to do. So, as uh, Horkheimer used to say, keep looking up. So that's it. I appreciate your attention. So I talked to my, uh, my current projects. I'm working on the 20, and then we'll see about the 42s. Um, the 16 inch scope, it's about a year and a half old now, and it's on its original silver coating. The 30 inch, by the way, is coming up to the two year mark of its silver coating. Um, the coatings do not look brand new, but they're quite serviceable and usable at the eyepiece, so I continue to use them. 
the new uh, software enhanced versions of the Ronke tests that I developed, the matching, the unwrap, the band and grid tests. And then um, just to emphasize the awe of viewing through the eyepiece and may you experience it too. So that's it. Um, comments, questions? Yeah, Mel, uh, first, thank you for, for that presentation. My, I have a question about the 16 inch. Mm -hmm. You have a, um, uh, a shroud on the 16 inch that is, uh, that is not fabric. It's that corrugated plastic material, I think. Is that right? It's flock board. Flock board. Ah, okay. All right. So do, do you think that that is contributing to the, uh, to the, to the 16 inch mirrors lack of thermal response to the falling temperatures? Yes. So ideally I would implement an Ed Allen solution uh, that you have Howard, where you blow mm -hmm. mirror against the backside and then use an annulus. Is that the correct term for yeah. a, a ring just in front of the mirror that directs that light back across the mirror's face where it then meets and then it spirals upward to the second gen. But like many of my projects, I, I don't implement any everything I'd like to do because it would just add time to the project. Mm -hmm. So what I found is that these thin mirrors are um, sensitive to being exposed to the night sky. Um, if the front cools down, they will work and become overcorrected. Now the 16 doesn't have near the touchiness of the 30, but it has a little bit of it. So by putting the shroud on, I ensure that the primary mirror hardly ever sees the night sky. And in, indeed in the year and a half I've used it, I've never uh, felt the need. I actually have a fan that I can plug on um, to the back, but I've, it's just not attached. I've never needed it. And only once did I have to open the back vent for a couple of seconds. And um, so this, um, semi-rigid shroud is, is key, um, is not so much to block the light, because I observe from a, a dark location that it's to help control the thermals. Mm -hmm. um, and this goes back to the John Dobson idea, and it goes back long before him, and that there's two ways to treat a mirror. One is either lock it into the tube and hope that it just stays in this happy thermal space, or you know, blast it um, and get it equilibrated to the sky, um, like uh, Ed Allen's system does. So uh, that's actually for thermal control. Okay. So do you have plans to do something similar on your 30 inch? No, because it's working good enough. Um, I usually have to turn the fan on once in the night for maybe 30 seconds. And the mirror, you could just watch it come back in the shape. It's an amazing demonstration to see a mirror equilibrate in front of your eyes. Just astonishing. And then yeah, it's yeah, usually yeah. fine for the rest of the night. So um, I'm not seeing the need to do that yet. Okay. Sorry if it's been asked before, but how do you support the 16? So I could barely hear because you must be far from the mic. So Howard, can you repeat the question? Yeah, he wants to know how do you support such a thin mirror? Well, so. The back support is, uh, and, and the 16 inch is just a six point. Uh, six point supports are actually quite effective. On the 30 inch is an 18 point. And then I do a sling around the rim. It's critical that the sling be at the center of gravity and there be no strain in the mirror when you settle it into the sling. Otherwise, um, you can see the warpage in the start test pretty easily. Uh, yeah, so the back support is not near as important. Uh, it is true that when you do finite element analysis and you look at uh, the point to point distance, uh, it doesn't matter if the mirror is meniscus, um, you know, if it's three, four inches apart from point to point, that glass of a certain thickness is going to sag. And technically, we're looking at sagging and shear. Uh, the same, whether it's meniscus or not, because in that scale, there's no meniscus effect. But there does seem to be a slight overall stiffness to the meniscus shape um, as a whole. And, uh, and I think that helps with the edge support. The, um, the next level up with the edge support is to move it to a back central support 
or do like the pros do, where they lift up the upper edge of the mirror using a static mounts and pull the edge upward so that the mirror doesn't flop down anymore. So that's how I support the uh, these thin mirrors. It's not as big a deal as you think. I have a question about slang. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but just just speak up more. Yeah, the mirror edge would be like this, right? If it's a meniscus, like it would be pointing upwards. Bottom. Well, in a oh, well, let me get this one, Mel. The, yeah. the meniscus starts out as a the flat piece, the glass, yeah. and the edge is ninety degrees. Yeah. To the front and back surfaces, when it's slumped, that edge becomes bent and, and this, so this blank and mine mm -hmm. have been machined after slumping so ah. they have a cylindrical vertical okay. uh, edge to them okay. making the sling far more tractable because mm -hmm. otherwise uh you um, would have well i'm not sure if, i'm not sure actually if it mel <laughs> If they hadn't machined that edge, would the would the sling support it more easily, or would it be more difficult? It would be easier, yeah. and that's because there's a secret trick to these meniscus mirrors. Ah. And as you and Howard know, it turns out that the thickness of the mirror that we have been working with is the sagitta of the mirror. So the back rim here happens to be the center of gravity of the mirror. So all you have to do is get that sling without tension or stress, get that mirror to slip into that sling nice and perfectly. And as long as you support it on this back rim. Now on the 30 inches that Howard and I have, uh, the edge is not machined. It sticks out, the back edge sticks out a tiny, tiny bit because of this lump. So it makes a perfect resting spot for that sling. So in which case, I use aluminum banding for that to keep the um, sling stiff. On this mirror, I use just a thin piece of Formica because it's machined. And as long as I keep the center of the sling on this back rim, taking advantage of the sagita equaling the uh, mirror thickness, then it all works out really nicely. So there is a secret success path to these mirrors. Um, Otherwise, you're going to have to come up with a new edge support. Yeah, I totally appreciate that. Um, boy, you should see the things I see in the test stand because I'm using a sling in my test stand. Um, I just wanted to point out that there now seems to be some momentum uh, for placing a fairly large order for these things from uh, Display Optics and Technology Inc. where we got this. Um, I suggest that if we do place that order, we specifically request that they do not machine the edge. As nice as it is, <laughs> I think it's causing me more problems. Yeah, I would think it would. Yep. Mel, this is Jeff Bolden. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. I do question your 42 inch sling because your center of gravity is not on the edge of the mirror. that bridge <laughs> yeah so i don't have enough question marks on this page to question everything with the 42s so the sagita of the 42s is close to an inch and the glass thickness is going to be five eighths so i don't know how i'm going to support this so um, but you know only go to 45 degrees <laughs> yeah um, a bore hole in the middle and support it through the center. That's what I'm and I, I actually did that to a 24 inch and it actually works pretty well. Um, so I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but you know what? My attitude toward the 42s is similar to one of the um, um, oh, Rover. We, we lost you. Yeah. For, uh, are you still there? Uh, can you hear me yeah. now? Okay. Yes, so, we can. Um, uh, one of the early Mars rovers, they didn't really have money to do the project, so they adopted this project's philosophy of they're going to keep going until they fail, and then they're going to ask for more money at the next stage. And they eventually got the rover on Mars, and it worked a huge success. So they didn't know 
and waterfall project style exactly how they're going to do everything. All they worried about was just conquering the next hill. So mm -hmm. on these, I'm just, um, oops. Can you hear me now? Somehow? Uh -huh. yeah. OK, OK. Uh, something happened there on the Zoom. So I'm just worrying about how I'm going to pick these up and um, grind them and so forth and make the tool and then how I map them. My gosh, if I can get to that point, I'm going to adopt the philosophy of the impossible problem. I am so glad to be here. <laughs> <clears throat> Say, Mel, this is Terry yes. Lum. Uh, my suggestion on your 42 inch is to use an airbag support. Yes, um, until the air pressure changes and stuff. But yeah, um, um, the original MMT was done that way. So yeah, it's an idea. Well, Thanks. actually, actually, uh, years ago, I came up with a, a pressure compensation scheme. Of, actually, trivial. Uh, basically, you have a uh, another container, if you will, and uh, a weight that is the same specific density as your mirror and uh, operating on a diaphragm and as you tilt the telescope it automatically tilt with the telescope of course uh, it automatically compensates oh i see well now that's an interesting idea so yes thank you uh, uh the only consideration is of course uh thermal uh cooling of the airbag if you will uh i haven't Totally figured out that one yet, but uh, that's solvable. Yes. Well, uh, I will try to remember your idea if I get to that point. Well, I'll correspond with you uh, later on. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, comments? That's pretty imp impressive work that you did on that Bronte software. I seconded. Beautiful work. Oh yeah, I think we're all, all quite impressed. <laughs> so well, remember, not, I think I Rob because he's been using it for the mirror process of making the mirror. Um, I do highly recommend that you adopt a second test to confirm what you're seeing. And uh, in my case, this is a star test, but if other people, there will be other kinds of tests. Um, the Rocky can get you there very quickly, and um, that's great, but um, but do have a second test in there. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you put me in charge of the Hubble mirror, you know, maybe NASA <laughs> would not have been so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that's true. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm reminded that of that 12 and a half inch mirror that uh, Pierre recently refigured and he tested it using, what was it, four different methods? Yeah, Pierre here. Yes, uh, I tested it with. Uh, it's a very thick mirror, so star testing it would be uh, difficult here, especially here in Canada with the dropping fall temperatures. So I I used uh, various null tests like uh, the Ross null test, and I have a 16 inch perforated optical flap, so I used that as well. And of course, I guided uh, most of the work uh, through using Mel's uh, matching Ronke test, which was really practical. And in the end, uh, and I just retouched it again yesterday. I can't help myself. But, oh, no, uh, Pierre, no. You're yes, done. I Stop did. it. Let it go. No. <laughs> it is so good. What are you doing? No, no, I retouched the edge because I was bothered by, uh, because I used uh, uh, Dale's uh, uh, um, interferogram uh, program for the last part and uh and i just finished uh, uh just finished uh, doing all the uh igrams uh, uh yesterday and it's it's like 0.95 strel now and and very good but uh i'm not going to try to retouch the surface but all this to say that it's important to have another test uh because uh, when i first did the matching ronki test and i thought i had it the lines look really straight uh, but then when I I did the 16 inch optical flat uh, double pass autocollimation, I saw there was some curvature in the in the bands. So I I I redid all my 
checks and and I found that I was overcorrected by about a quarter wave and I was able to correct that and uh, and now it's uh, it's perfect promise smell I'm not going to touch it anymore <laughs> good <laughs> okay okay anyone else no okay well thank you very much Mel All right, next up, um, we have Bill Thomas talking about his lateral image test. And we'll give him a, a few minutes to get uh, set up here and uh, we'll get going. Okay, there you go. Okay, so here is your. Oh, you, I take that. Oh, you, you, no, I, I run it then? Oh, you, I can run it for you if you want. If you want, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Probably until we get to that. In the middle somewhere, we'll do a red sheet. I go this way. Of course, you'll have to fly that thing. <laughs> well, we'll see how it goes. Okay. 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 It would really be better if you did sit here because the, the computer will pick up your voice a lot better than if you're okay. What's sitting the, up there. Page up, page down. Please. So, oh, yeah, okay. right here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And okay. you know Okay, we're, we're going to start now. So, we're not taking a break. <laughs> so, please, please come back. Yeah. <clears throat> Where did you go? Yeah, take it away. Well, I'm Bill Thomas, and uh, I'm going to talk about the lateral image test. I claim it's accurate and fast testing. A few of the people here have used it. Make sure that your people are Louder? Louder? No, just make can, sure. Can, it, can everyone hear out in Zoom land? Yes. Okay, thank oh, you. Oh, good. So anyway, uh, there's my email address there, and there's the, the website that describes the test. I'm not going to get into the details, real, you know, grungy details if you if you want to get into it they're there on the website and i think it's fully explained and the bottom link is to an earlier test that came about and i still have sort of like that one too so let's get going here well i was figuring a a 12 and a half inch f 4.6 mirror and around early 2000s. And I was flunking full cult 101 big time. And so I ran across this test that was called the, the lateral wire test. It was sort of popular for a while in the early 2000s. And uh, I tried it. Uh, and I again couldn't get consistent results, but it's really interesting in that 
perpendicular to the optical axis, they had a rail and they had a, a device, which you see down here, a wire and a light source. And if you looked over the wire, you could see the shadow on the mirror. And if you use the felt tip and mark the mirror where the zones were, then you would get the wire over that mark and then take a reading and proceed across. The problem was that reading had to be very, very accurate. It had to be within better than one ten thousandths of an inch. Very difficult. And I concluded I failed because I was taken too darn long. Things were changing. But I, it's really an interesting test. And uh, we'll skip to the next page here. And so I, being into photography at the time, said, well, I'll just, what's needed is to be able to capture all of the zones at once. And so I used a mask, which was a caustic mask, but with all the holes open. So I would catch an image of all the slits on this film. And then I would develop the film and then I have to scan it into the computer on a flatbed scanner and then try and measure with, with a Photoshop where each of those guys were. It worked, but it was very slow and very cumbersome. And my uh, mentor said, Bill, You've got to go to a digital camera. This is not practical. Uh, the equations I were using, I had kind of derived out of the caustic. And you can sort of see that the caustic is a, just a dead ringer for the problem. You can study how the caustic you were use. Oh, I, oh I'm a, sorry. Oh, it's all right. That's the next one anyway. I'm trying to get rid of this, but I can't get rid of it. Get rid of what? Yeah. Okay. What's wrong? Yeah. Oh, the top part. Oh, okay. That's that's probably my fault. No, just keep going. Hey, okay. So, let's see. Where was I at here? Well, the uh, it worked, but it was slow. And so then the next problem was try to get a camera, digital camera, and the equations to work with that. And that didn't happen until about 2007. So there's quite a gap in there. Um, okay, so we go to the next one. So the question is, what does this, what's the root of this test? Where does it really belong mathematically? Well, it belongs in the caustic. And uh, about the same time, Jim Burroughs, author of Six Tests, also concluded the same thing. And his test, all you could, you could put in the, those where all those slits were measured and the software it already, already would work. All you needed to do was put in a constant X parameter and it worked and you could get the surface and the strail that way. And that will become important later on that's a great, six tests is a great program. I understand some people can't get it to work anymore. I can get it to work. I don't know what the problem is, I, uh, Microsoft. So here's what I came up with. So it's a caustic mask, all the holes open, a slit light source, and a digital camera behind the slit because that's the way I could, couldn't mount the darn camera. With the lateral test, the one we the lateral wire test, you could take the measurements in front of ROC, and that's what primarily what they were doing. But now we're in back of ROC with this lash up, <coughs> and that causes some problems because you have to be far enough back that all of the rays are where you think they are. The outer ray is the outer ray. If you move in too close, you'll get you'll get the wrong answers. So now you have to be back and you need to be back far enough to get the full width on the image plane so you get the most precision out of it. 
I've, some early people were trying to use a small camera, but you can see that that's not going to work. So then, as luck would have it, I ran across this other program called Image J by the National Institute of Health. It's free, it's a Java program. It's incredible. All you need to do is, as you see, you put a, a box, selection box over a slit, and it has a feature called center of mass. You click that and it gives you a position. You see that on the slide, there's numbers after the decimal point. We're talking about, you know, a position of a of a slit measured from the far left side all the way across. And you're going to say, now, wait a minute. How is it possible to have precision less than a pixel? Well, think about it. You have all these cells that are picking up photons. And this program figures out the center of mass of all of those, and it's repeatable. No human judgment. It's unbelievable, great little program. I mean, it's unbelievable, I think, anyway. Also, Lonnie uses, a, and I do also use, after I copied him, a pinhole instead of a slit. And he can get precisions even further than I can get with a slit. I I want to say right away that so this thing is a kind of a combination of many other people's works. Now they have a spreadsheet I hope to show you in a minute, and that spreadsheet uh, computes focals, and it uses a thing called Excel Solver. And the equations are kind of, you're going to say, they're kind of backwards here. It can, given a Z, when the, the Z is the slump up there, uh, it computes what the value of image J would be. So we're kind of backwards here. So then it tries another trial Z, little Z, and again, trying to match what we put into the program. And then it quickly finds the answer that we just do click and it has the answer. And if you're mathematically inclined, the, the very first one of those was Newton Rapson. And of course it uses basically the derivative to find a trial, it gets the derivative, causes the x-axis, that's the next value. But these solvers are much more sophisticated now. So that's the that's the guts of the spreadsheet, if that makes any sense to you. Now, one other important thing is that you can put in a hypothetical mirror with any conic constant, not just a parabola, not just a minus one, any one of them you wish. And then it will compute what you should get for your image J values, which you can then put back into six tests. And six tests will get a strel of 1.0000, which verifies the equations. Very, very important. It's always nice to have some backup. So let's take a look. Oh, and also very important is the mass. Those masks have to be incredibly accurate. And Lonnie has solved that problem. He uh, uses a router on a rail and a digital readout. So you can, the digital readout, he can go over great distances. I mean, well, relatively great distances to a thousandth of an inch. And the, the precision you need is, really needs to be that good. I must say I copied it. <laughs> Thank you, Lonnie. Oh, you're sure. <laughs> so what we have here again, so we have image J values coming into the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet computes the full calls. It also computes what the input should be for six tests. So you can put those values into six tests and get your surface. You can put them into figure XP and get your surface. They agree, will agree. Another 
sanity check. Now we come to the fly in the ointment, the tester, the lit tester. And that's this is where the where this is ha, this is limited the uh, people who want to try the darn thing because that's my creation and it's it it's you remember the old the old machine gun that the Russians had they I don't forgot what they called it but you could just pull a barrel out and slap a new barrel in and the way it would go and it was barely you know machining was just you know, but it worked. That's what we need here. So, well, it's important to talk about it for a bit. You can see that there's a optical alignment laser. When you put that sucker on the center of the mirror, what happens is that the lateral uh, ways are now parallel to the mirror. And also where the camera would be mounted is perpendicular to the optical axis. You don't want your image plane this way or that way. You want that perpendicular. I won't go into the details of how that's done. It's on the website. But this lash up is too complicated and it needs to be made simpler. I'm gonna bring it in and put it up hoping for ideas. Now Lonnie's got one too. It's an incredibly great one. He'll show you his. It's a big improvement over the, this lash up. So let's see what else we got here. We wanna see that how to use this thing. Well, you first set up the mirror and the tester and you, name, you aim that laser by turning it on a tripod at the center of the mirror, not the center. You can do, hit, hit anywhere, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna come back, same place. And you have a target and you twist the mirror until the, rate, the beam is on the center of that target. And the point of that is that when you put your knife edge or your raunchy, it's right there. You don't have to run around the room looking for that return beam, it's there. And then, you turn the tester such that the laser beam is at the center of the mirror. And that's when you have everything matches up. You've got the lateral parallel. The point of that lateral being parallel is you do your raunchy stuff as it's shown in the number three here. And then you measure where the ROC is. And then you know how far back you need to go to get the image to expand all the way across and take advantage of the full frame of the of the camera. Well, if you move it back and it's not parallel, you're gonna be hunting for that image. It's gonna be all over the place. So that's the important part. The whole point of this thing is we can get test results in, in less than a half an hour and go on and figure. And uh, that tester I showed you will do that, but it's it's it's, it's a limiting factor in the, in the success of people using the tester. I've made a few of them. Uh, I, I've had a loaner that I sent out. Uh, I've sold one or two and I sold it at parts cost. This is 2019 tester parts cost. And it's, you can see it's 153 bucks. A good part of that is the aluminum. I don't know what that would be nowadays. So, that kind of concludes my talk. And if you have questions, try to answer them. Comment on your laser. Uh, yeah. Alignment. Yeah. Um, I did a tri shift stabler. I did a tri shift stabler a number of years ago. Uh -huh. Four inch mirror with a 53 foot radius of curvature. Oh. And I was luckily, lucky enough to have put a laser, alignment laser, on my Pico tester. And it just took minutes to align it. Without that, it would have taken days, but yeah. you know, put the laser on the mirror, walk out to the center of the cul-de-sac where the mirror was, put it back on the tester, <laughs> get the test. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, Rob Brown here. Uh, I've been experimenting with 
my own concoction of a whatever test this is, it, whether it's a Hartman or a lateral image test or whatever. But I thought at the time earlier this year that I could make this a lot simpler by using a beam splitter cube and having the laser and the sensor basically on the same axis with the beam splitter combining them. Uh -huh. And boy, did that make things a lot simpler. However, I've never been able to successfully um, get all the math to work out. And I think I need some help with that. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there's something there with the, the beam splitter in really simplifying your rig uh -huh. and all of the requirements around it. Of course, the other thing I did was I 3D printed up a fixture so I could slide my camera in with this inch and a quarter adapter and the, all that. So it's just it's just much more straightforward. You're going to love his. I, yeah. You're going to love his. Yeah, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen his. Yeah. And I do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I might, might mention it. The, one of the problems, as soon as you move that, you know, back when I was using film, mm -hmm. the math was just dead simple. You move that image plane back and the math goes, you know, because you're, you're really dealing with, you know, if I think of the uh, flow call, a fixed flow call, it's an approximation. And as soon as you start moving the camera back, that approximation gets a little, a little bad. And so now you need, that's why I took from roughly 2002 to 2007 for me to get the first, I have two sets of equations, they're on the website. There, there are probably more and there's probably a lot simpler ones than I've got. Can I comment on this beam splitter here? Yeah. Um, on Bill's test, it's the horizontal thing, the vertical off axis thing doesn't really do any damage. Well, long as it's always been a question because we've got eight radials. So the conversation we were having with the beam splitter, and you can check me if I'm wrong, was that as it comes out as planar, it may refract differently at, at angles, you know, at each angle might refract differently. So we were thinking of maybe having a spherical face on one face of the beam splitter so they would be orthonormal. Yeah, Baldy and I have argued this a bit. Yeah. Um, uh, no, you want a you want a good flat beam splitter. It introduces a a window into the system, but um, you, yeah, you're right. A spherical wavefront will then interact with that flat surface and see spherical aberration, but it's double passed through a flat window, and when you're all done, you're back to well. In all honesty, back we haven't again. found any anomalies by not using the beam splitter. No, I know that. Yeah. My problem was, how am I going to build this sucker? Oh, yeah. okay. And it was simply a matter of trying to make it a simpler thing to build. Yeah. The, the, the ray tracing works out. It, it, the, the spherical aberration is canceled in double pass through that window. Yeah, it's, uh, we, haven't, we haven't discovered a problem yet. Yeah. I'm not yeah. saying there isn't one. And this is all on a future talk, but after his talk and my talk, mine is on axis, and it's hopefully going to acid test his. Oh, good for this okay. off axis nature. Yeah. Thank you. Good meeting you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Take care of this. All right. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. All right. So we will stop this share. There we go. All right. So we're a little ahead of schedule here. Take that out. We'll tee up the next presentation. So we'll be um, ahead of schedule and we'll have a earlier lunch break. So we'll just take a moment here and we'll get the next presentation teed up. Okay, I'll get rid of that. There we go. Okay, where is the... I guess we can turn your computer on. I've got to figure it out.
Why didn't that just come up? Yeah, I told him about it. I got the corporate actuators and stuff. Yeah. The LIGO actuators. Oh, how's your business? How's your world doing? Oh. Okay, we're getting there, everyone. Hold on. So, let's go back to Zoom. When you when you move you seven you can't find seven you want to find it. We moved just the little shop we had. It's a lot of job. The organization, the organization and back then. Uh, what is it? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm in here for I see. That's what you mean. Really, that's what happens. Yeah. There's a good thing over there. Yeah, right. What do you mean? Oh, now it's going in. Let's go. I figured out why. Yeah. Okay. We were just a little bit ahead of you. Okay. You ready? I think so. Okay, here we go. Lonnie Robinson up next. Hi, everybody. My name is Lonnie Robinson, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with uh, like minds and, and knowledgeable telescope mirror makers. Um, it's it's tough to follow Mel. It, I've been following his uh, ronky tests with great interest, and it, it, extremely interesting. Uh, <clears throat> it's nice to let, I think maybe we'll qualify into that second test he talks about, so the backup test or something like that. Um, I've <clears throat> I've had uh, want to give credit to uh, uh, I think uh, Bill talked about a lot of people have being involved in this, and I and Bill is one of my mentors. He. Uh, he's pioneered this whole idea of the camera. I, uh, it's it's been done for a lot of years, but it hasn't been done with the amateur. And he's uh, I think one of his first statements was he wanted to make it easier for the amateur to do and something we could actually use. And and he's definitely done that and paid the way for for my kind of extension of the uh, Hartman test. And <clears throat> let's see here, page up. Starting out with focal testing. This is the Stellafane plan. I, I imagine you've all seen it online, but uh, it was very detailed. They had all the measurements and everything. I didn't have to create a thing, and it was great. Uh, created the uh, my first uh, focal tester. What year was that? Uh, probably about 2002, right in there somewhere. And I did my first mirror. My first mirror was a 16-inch F5. And everybody told me at the time, he said, don't make a big mirror, start with a little one, but it's a lot of work for a little mirror. So I thought, well, I might as well put my effort into the one that I wanted and and uh, I'm glad I did. It was uh, the way to go. 
uh, Pocal worksheet, uh, interesting story there. I, I was, I have a, <clears throat> I have a pizza restaurant for 45 years and, and a little bit isolated from the uh, ATM community there. And so I got online and found uh, David Harbour's art, David Harbour's article on understanding Focal and decided to create my own worksheet on it. Uh, back then I was still using Lotus one, two, three. So it was uh, quite a, quite a fun experiment to do when I could take a break and get back in the office and, and uh, do something that I'd like to do. Um, <clears throat> this test that I made has uh, four different iterations. You can add in, you can add in four readings and it'll average them all out for you. And, and indeed I couldn't duplicate a reading well enough to uh, depend on it being accurate. So actually on this one, I took four readings and I threw one out because it was so bad. So that's, this one ended up with three readings. And you notice it's a perf pretty much a perfect mirror. You know, it's really in the curve. So um, it averages four tests. I hand ground and figured it myself and uh, it turned out almost perfect. We had a um, an ATM guy in Sacramento that had the robo tester, and that was seemed to be a pretty accurate uh, rendition of test of the Foucault test. And I would take my mirror down, and I let him uh, run the test on it, and then I'd take his numbers and go home and try and get the same numbers with, with my eye on the Foucault test. Kind of train myself to get them in there, and I thought, wow, I've got this nailed. And look at this mirror. This is great. So it didn't take too many years later, we, I created the, uh, the Hartman design and uh, it's got a Strel ratio of 0. 0.4. <laughs> At, yes, yes, the same mirror. And you'll notice that <clears throat> we'll talk about this Hartman test as I go, but um, it has uh, each one of these lines represents a radius on the mirror. So we're getting the whole mirror. And you can see most of the errors are closer to the center. So it has a fairly decent outer edge. And I've been happy with it, you know, in my bliss that this is a great mirror. But the bottom test uh, underneath, and I can use the mouse to show everyone else, this one down here is the uh, average of all these ranges. So it looks pretty decent down there, kind of a little bit like the Foucault test that I took. But that was fun. I've been happy. I still like that mirror. It's uh, Probably the F5 has a lot to do with it. It's pretty forgiving. The challenges of Foucault, uh, Bill and I have talked about this for a long, long time. Uh, judgment error is the big one. Uh, the Everest pin, Everest pin helped me a lot because it tend to give me a little more open view of the mirror. I didn't have the little windows of the coder screens. So um, the biggest problem we had was test stand creep. Uh, if you didn't do this in the morning when the, when the air was fairly even temperature and stable, then the floor, the only thing I can figure is the floor and every the walls, everything move as the sun comes up and away goes your test. By the time you get halfway across and come back to the mid zones, things change. So inconsistent testing was the big problem. It requires several sets of numbers, so it took a long time. And um, ended up that I wanted a whole mirror test. I'm just a, a data junkie. I've got to have all the information. So. Easy Hartman, oops, that's not it. Sorry, I'm not pushing the wrong button yet. Uh, the Hartman test uh, was about 1900 invented by a German astronomer. And about 1940, there was a gentleman that wrote an article, Dr. Cuffey, and he described a simplified Hartman because the original Hartman, of course, takes the inside and the outside of the ROC focus or the focus. They take two photographs and, uh, and compare them. So it was pretty complicated, and that pretty much ran all the amateur interest away for years. But <clears throat> Dr. Cuffey described using only one photo behind the radius of curvature. And he also gave all the ideas of how uh, mathematically figure it. Uh, equal, it just uses equal triangles, and that's something I could handle. I'm not a great mathematician, so I thought, I can do that. And, and the, the thing that really rang a bell with me was, well, this is not too much different than Foucault, because we're just placing the the uh, focal length of each zone. And that was the whole idea behind it. Um, Alan C. Porter uh, used a digital camera on the 200 inch mirror in 1985. And uh, that was one of the first uses I could find of a digital camera actually taking the Hartman test on a mirror. Okay, let's go to the next one. The Easy Hartman takes the whole mirror instead of 
it, it gives us an example of taking, you know, we used uh, the concept of one single photo. You can get the whole mirror data all at once, which is really, eliminates all those focal problems of the eye fatigue and the finding the zones. And, and uh, mostly the, you don't have as much thermal problem with it or anything changing on you get it at the same time. So the, the data is very interesting. One of the things that really uh, came to mind <clears throat> uh, through working with this test was the astigmatism. We've had a hard time defining that. And we've worked with the steel balls with a light uh, reflection on it. And we watched the uh, refraction images off the uh, pinpoint star test and trying to come up with something to tell us where it is, if it's there and, and so forth. And I like Mel's comment that uh, you try and do your best to make sure you don't get it. So you your conditions of making your mirror, you should end up with an astigmatism-free mirror. But the astigmatism, I defined it as being anywhere on the mirror. Any zone on that mirror uh, can have the same idea of one high and one low side. On it. So uh, this tells us exactly where all that stuff is. The uh, mask is one of the fun parts about the, uh, the test, it's creating that accurate mask. This test is very sensitive on the mask zone locations, and it's very sensitive on the uh, photograph zone locations as well, the pixel locations. So uh, Bill talked a little bit about it. I use a DRO um, <clears throat> to uh, locate the uh, router, but the router was a plunge router, so it had a lot of slop in it. As I'd push this thing down, you could be off, you know, 5, 10, 20 thousands easily. So I built this little cutter up here on the top with a bearing right in the center I used a couple stops off of two different cutters and then a brass guide ring, which fits that bearing just perfectly. So as the router goes down, it's really accurate. And so we're able to get this by coming back and retesting with this little, I have a little plug tester down here in the corner. Ah, thank you. This little plug tester is, is an exact, um, goes through the brass hole in the bottom of the router when you take the router out and goes into the hole of the mass so we can verify all those hole locations that we cut. And uh, it, uh, it we're getting less than five thousandths, uh, plus or minus, so on each hole, which is quite an accomplishment on a big one. This, so you can see the mask on the screen. This is the, for the, those that are here, this is what it looks like. And uh, we've got the little mounts on the side that hang it up on the side of the- That's like made out of ABS? Uh -huh, it's made out of 60,006 ABS. And uh, this example here, the holes are a little bit too large. I like to keep at least the diameter of the hole between the holes for spacing. So the last 12 inch I made, I, this is a half, we went down to a three eighths. So we've got a lot more spacing in between the holes and that's uh, better for diffraction and so forth. But it's pretty easy to hang on the mirror. Once you get it all adjusted with these exterior adjusters uh, out on the outside here, we've got little little screws right here, nylon bolts. And uh, once you center that mask on, the, the, the successive tests are pretty easy because it falls pretty much right where you are starting with it. The uh, centering of the mask is critical. So we built this little plug that's in the center with the blue arrow. Uh, it fits the hole and then it's got a hole of its own right in the center. And along with that, uh, marking the exact center on the mirror with a Sharpie, you can get that pretty darn close to the center. Obviously, if it's skewed at all, you're going to get a false reading on one of the ranges on the outside. Uh, this is the test stand that I built. Um, basically, we're only taking a photograph. So theoretically, you could just put it on a tripod. And if you could fuss with it enough to get it accurate, you could actually get a photograph that would do it. But um, this stage is really simple because I used, um, um, I used a, I started out with a drill press uh, cross stage for milling and it was like less than 50 bucks for this little cross stage I thought wow that's a great idea and I put another singular one right under here so I've got an xyz stage that goes up and down that makes it so much easier to work with with the camera because you're tra traipsing back and forth through your mirror trying to adjust it up a little bit or down a little bit and uh, you can do it all right there at the, at the tester and then <clears throat> all these little plates, the camera has a little slider plate right here and it, that like these guys right here, the slide on the top and we can see it here, but they slide up on the top. So you change your, uh, your pieces very easily. And this one here, I put a DRO on it also, which is pretty darn handy. I really like the idea of the DRO zeroing. Wherever you are, you don't have to figure where a dial indicator starts and it makes it really simple for me. 
the procedure for testing <clears throat> is uh, very similar to uh, the lateral test that Bill talks about. Uh, first, we have a laser, and I used a, a laser collimator instead, which is this guy right here. And uh, you send it, you point that to the mirror, and then the return beam comes back to the little side target on the laser collimator. And I also have a little plate that I drilled some holes in. So we've got two different light, we've got two light sources. One is here, and another one is here. And so obviously the alignment is different on it. So this little plate that I've put on the uh, tester has spots on it we can target. So we can go right to bronchi testing or right to the uh, camera testing. Which is which? Which is which? Yeah. Um, this is the ronky test right here. So we put a little ronky screen in the middle and then the little the lower light turns on and illuminates it all through the screen. Right. And then uh, this one here is a movable light source. And I'll talk more about that in a sec. But we're trying to keep this thing located on the radius of curvature. So as we move back for the camera, I move the light forward to equal the same distance. And then I use a crosshair eyepiece. And this was all highly, uh, you know, influenced by Bill's ideas. Uh, he's the... Uh, uh, the setup makes it so much easier to have these little things that when you cross your eyepiece right on the mirror, your camera is right on the money. You don't have to mess with it. So all these things are getting us to an easy test. Okay. The little light source is a little, uh, I can say it right, Lamography pinhole light. And I kind of decided on... Uh, a pretty good sized hole, a 0.4 millimeters, a pretty good sized hole, but it seems to illuminate much better. If you get too much smaller, it, the uh, camera has to take too long and, uh, to get the image and so forth. But the whole idea is what we'll do is find the radius of curvature with the uh, Ronke, and that's the point right there where those lines cross. And uh, <clears throat> then we'll attach the camera after we've aligned it and move the stage back to where we can get the image of the uh, mask pretty much as large as you can on the, on the uh, screen at CCD, on the camera CCD. When, when that happens, then I want to move the light source right here forward so we stay at that plane with the uh, ROC. And I've tried really hard to get it close. We've got it down to slightly over a quarter inch between the light source and the actual um, uh, focal point. Uh, trying, you know, anything off axis is going to cause an error, but it's so close that uh, it seems to be negligible. This is why I'm thinking beam splitter cube. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And we can uh, reiterate our discussions on beam splitters too. And I'm kind of worried about the light diffracting as well, because we're talking about the light spread on the CCD and any changes in that, I, you know, I just... Murphy's Law, I worry about it, but I'd like to try it and cross-check it. It'd be really interesting. Okay. okay. I thought about a light pipe as well, you know, like a Christmas tree light with a with a plastic light pipe. Get really close to it. But, yeah. Yeah. Here's that little target right here on the bottom that I talked about. I said I slide this in in place, and then uh, <clears throat> the uh, laser alignment tool comes out of that hole. And we can either uh, set up the return beam for that axis or this, at, this axis, depending on whether you're using the camera or the, or the ronky. We talked, Bill talked a lot about ImageJ. It's a fantastic program. It's free, uh, which is amazing. And when it comes up on the screen, it looks so innocent because it's a little strip of, you know, basically nothing there. And then you open up the menus and the, the detail and the ability of this program is really something. I actually did this in uh, Photoshop, and you can find center of mass of a spot in Photoshop, but it's really difficult. This makes it so easy. We reach up and pull our selection tool and set up all the perimeters on the image J to what we want. And, uh, it takes about, um, it takes me less than three minutes to do all these holes on that mask. Just click, 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 moving the mouse with the you, selection you tool. You don't save your, your regions of interest as a file and then just apply it to the next time you use it? Not following that. Oh, you mean as far as the uh, as far as image J? Yeah. Yeah. You save uh, all those regions of interest, and then you don't you do it once. Uh -huh. Once you're close, you, it only works when your mirror is really close to being done. But those those dots aren't going to move very much. True. And you yeah. just save that file and open it up next time, and boom, you got your centroids. 
Yeah, I've never done that, but oh. um, uh, each time we run it, you know, for each different condition, MHJ keeps some of the memory in as far as the settings on uh, how the numbers are processed and so forth. Is that an actual image? Yes. Yeah. So we're actually seeing a, a focused image of the each little telescope from each little hole, and, but we're we're picking the center of mass of the whole the whole hole, and uh, not a pinpoint. It really isn't a pinpoint. Uh, interesting note here too is the uh, image J counts pixels from the upper left hand corner, so it counts this way and it counts down this way. So it gives us an X Y reading of where they where the each one of those holes is located. Here's a little round selection tool for the MJ. And uh, we found some variation according to how big this circle is for selection uh, as to how accurately it picks it up. Because obviously you could pick up the next hole and get some uh, different uh, data from it. But I like to center it as best I can. And I have it, uh, I picked a size of a, almost the distance between two holes. So that seemed to work really well. Takes less than three minutes. We read it. Here's the little diagram I have on my software. And we read across axis one, and then we come down to axis two, like these little arrows down here, then down three and four, and picks up the data that you see on the right. Um, image J puts it into a column almost like this, and all I do is cut and paste and put it into the Excel. So all the X reads and Y reads, and this is for axis one, two, three, and four, and so forth down. And here's the spreadsheet that I came up with that shows uh, pretty much the whole mirror. Turns eight, returns eight ranges, uh, a range being just uh, from the center out and then the axis being the whole one line here. So we've got four axes and eight ranges. Um, <clears throat> this also outputs focal data for use with uh, figure XP, which is pretty helpful at the end. We've found it not to be extremely useful for the rough figuring somehow because it has a lot of very of uh, adjustment variations that you can put into it. Um, astigmatism is the real fun part that I uh, experimented with. Uh, I've got the program so it actually counts pixels from the outer zone sevens and compares them with the other zones. And the distance between those pixels is obviously the focal point, and uh, any difference in that is the definition of astigmatism. So it gives us an idea, a quantitative idea of what the stigmatism is. Yes, this the each diameter would be across here. That really shows you why Foucault is such a problem. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. That Should... really shows why Foucault is such a problem. Yeah, it tells you where, where it is, doesn't it? You know, they're all different. Yeah, the right oh, yeah. side is different than the left side. We're on a absolutely both local call yeah. Well, yeah. and each radius, each diameter is different from the other diameters. Yes. Right. Yeah. And indeed, uh, if you take one zone over here, like zone four, and come to zone four, you can see the difference. There's not much, but that's a stigmatism too. That's the way I think of it. So yeah. you know, so in interior. The problem with the exterior is the program, and I'll talk about it in a second, but the program does not uh, differentiate where zone seven falls. So we have to actually get the pixel count to find out where it is. If zone sevens can be slightly different across the middle. Now we have a little chart right up here. I started out running pixel numbers. So this mirror that I just made has a 2.8 pixel difference on zone seven when comparing the maximum and the minimum pixels. Uh, change it to percentage so that uh, it works for all the different sizes of mirrors. But during the, this is an earlier test. So these are all the different zones inside, how many pixels off they actually are. And we determine uh, through uh, some other mirrors we watch, it's still, <clears throat> still researching it, but about 20 pixels on a 16 to 20 inch mirror, you've got a stigmatism problem. And you can see it in all the other tests. But under that, you can't see it too much in some of the common astigmatism tests. Um, we kind of drew a perimeter of about 10 pixels. So we're narrowing this down, how much we can allow, how much we can work with. Uh, now we're down to, I think, less than five pixels is a pretty good count. But if you get a 40-inch mirror, obviously, you get a lot of pixels there. So um, 
the, the difference would be a percentage. And I'll, I'll show you something about that in a second. Let's see, what did I miss here? Uh, yeah, it compares. And of course, it satisfies the uh, perfectionist craving, which is a, a definitely a, an affliction that I have for trying to get too perfect on everything. Uh, surface profiles. This is the uh, figure XP. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. It's so much fun talking to people that instead of a beginning astronomers trying to explain to them about testing mirrors when they're really looking to buy a telescope, a, a cheaper one. But uh, this is a surface profile where the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the Hartman test is taking slope and it's giving you the actual focal points of each one of the zones. So this is a surface uh, profile and you can see where you have to remove the glass and so forth, much like what Mel was doing, which is very cool. The trouble is here, I have to run the, um, um, uh, I have to run the figure XP for each one of the ranges on the, on the mask, but I do have an average of them all. So this one up here on this mirror shows me that I have a 99 strel and it's following between the, uh, below the 20 nanometer level. So that's kind of our target is to get a, uh, I know uh, uh, we've had a lot of discussions, how perfect a mirror do we want, but we kind of want to get above a 95 strel if we can. And that gives you some latitude. If you have a really good night, you've got some room of a really good mirror to perform. So obviously diffraction limited at 0.84, I believe. Yeah, uh, is uh, acceptable for most conditions. But... The fun part of this is you can use the mask to uh, figure with. So I index the mirror <clears throat> at a nine o'clock position and put it back in exactly the same place every time. And then and when you come up with an area you want to work, we simply mark it with a Sharpie mark here on the mirror. And uh, this kind of helps me with the size of the lap and so forth and how far to go with it and figuring the spots. I found that uh, <clears throat> as I bring the curve down from a sphere after we polish, that the more that I control the curve and keep it even on the way down, it ends up pretty accurate at the end. And astigmatism is the fun part of this test because it actually shows us exactly where it is and, and you can actually correct it if you need to. Or better still, we detect astigmatism early and if we've got a problem, go back and fix it before we even you know get to it with polishing and so forth. Uh, I drew this little chart for pixel measurements because it helped me uh, help me remember what happens. So if the pixel counts get larger, then <clears throat> it deviates from the uh, focus, of course, if it, uh, it makes the focus longer. Uh, less pixel count is longer, more pixel count is shorter for focus, so. Okay, I think we got that. This kind of explains something to me as I, when I discovered the, the uh, working the outer zone sevens can, if you go back to a sphere, for instance, you decide, well, I overworked my mirror. I guess it's too overcorrected. So I'm gonna back up a little bit. A lot of what you're doing is you're changing the slope of the outer zone sevens. And if you, claim, if you change the zone seven, it reflects on the other rest of the chart. So if you increase the focal length of zone seven, it will graphically lower the center of the mirror. So what we wanna do is decrease zone seven to bring it back more to a sphere and, and get back to where we can recorrect again. And it's helpful to think of it that way because it doesn't show up on the graph. Are you saying that uh, zone seven or the outer zone is um, always set to zero? On this program, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, normalize at zero. Normalize at zero, okay, right. thank you. Yeah. Uh, cooling issues with the uh, with testing have been very interesting because the test is so sensitive, it'll pick up just about everything. Uh, I haven't really tried the fingerprint like you see on some of the books, but you put the heat of your finger will cause enough distortion that you can pick up some changes. But I did, uh, I looked at my test stand and, and the mirror was sitting about a half an inch away from the uh, test stand. And I realized, well, there's no air you know, movement back there at all. So I just said, well, I'll try a fan. And I tried the fan blowing on the mirror back. And right away, it was really fun because I could see what was happening with the test. As I was testing, the fan would change the zones in the center and deflect it and distort it. So I thought, well, I'll turn the fan around. And I actually, now I draw the air from behind the mirror and exhaust it out the back. And it made it dramatically better. 
a very even change on the temperature. And all, th all through this um, temperature uh, experimentation, I, uh, was, I was using the early morning test of the nice, cool, steady air and temperatures to give me a baseline. And then I tried to duplicate that all day, which I could never do because the temperature changes would foul us up all day long. By putting this fan in the back and putting a shroud around the mirror and um, putting another fan in the front, and decreasing the 12 volt fan voltage to six. So it's just a draft. It really isn't a breeze or a blowing onto the mirror. I could very accurately get down to consistent testing just about any time I wanted to. And uh, I thought that was very interesting. It was so sensitive that we could, we, that I could actually see it happening as it was happening. I enjoyed that. This is a, one of those uh, uh, backup tests that I, discovered i mean it, it's nothing new of course but it, it it was said that if a mirror maker in the past had just measured one thing on his mirror and that was a sigetta that he would be he would know what he's doing and come up with a better mirror and that was back in the days where they were you know hand making mirrors and folk called like you know back in the dobson days and so forth but this is uh, basically a wire test but i use a ronky screen to do it so i reduced the ronky screen down to one line and i'll take a reading at the center and I'll take a reading at zone seven. And I've got a spot on the on my worksheet where I know exactly what that is. And that gives me an idea exactly where I am for, for a sanity check. And then I've got the, uh, we talked about the Hubble already. So trust but verify, no doubt. And the star test, of course, is your backup. Uh, <clears throat> we all know uh, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, Dobs the Dobson figured his mirrors with, the star test. And he simply said, when you're outside this radius of curvature, you've got a bright spot, it needs more work. And uh, there you go. But obviously all these, uh, these conditions have been familiar to you. Mirror quality, we tried for that uh, 95. Um, you notice there isn't a whole lot of difference in the central uh, concentration of air after 95. So you're not getting a whole lot. It, I don't know myself if it's totally visual, but uh, 95 is... An, an awfully good mirror and, and a one you're trying for but it's like a hole in one it's uh, not very not very often that it happens and a quarter wave of course is the Raleigh criteria for a diffraction limited that all the uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know if I mentioned but the uh, Ronke the uh, Miles LaCroix graph uh, demonstrates the uh, um, the uh, um, airy disc and the tolerance of the mirror, and uh, with the change, <clears throat> with the change of the mirror diameter, you're changing your ratio on every one of your zones that you're testing, and so the tolerance goes up on all the uh, on the miles of Croft graph. But if you can keep your tolerance inside of that, you've got a pretty good mirror. And uh, it, I think uh, David Harbour discussed it and said that it's okay to vary a little bit inside the horn, but you don't want it to go up and down like a zigzag. You want it to be a nice, long, smooth change. So we're, we're always trying for that roller criteria, at least, of course. We have a connection, uh, <clears throat> Northern California. <clears throat> Here's the uh, email address uh, for uh, my email and website and bills and uh, Jeff Baldwin and call it the ATM connection. We're all three different clubs. So it's kind of fun to collaborate and, and uh, bring this together and always trying to promote uh, ATM. And that's my presentation. I, Gladly take any questions and discuss what I can, sir. Yeah. So, um, why are there seven holes and seven? Um, like, well, um, I think the original part of it started with Foucault. We were only testing maybe five, and uh, Bill established that early on with his testing, and and seven is pretty darn, you know, a pretty big improvement. And you see, the more holes, uh, of course, the more accurate your test would be, but it gets closer to the edge too this, uh, with the holes. So we were able to get really close to the edge compared to Foucault. So would that change with the size of the mirror? No, it hasn't so far. And my reasoning is, is because the bigger the mirror, the bigger the tool you're using. So um, as you, you know, the, uh, the, as the uh, hole towards the perimeter of the mirror starts to space more, the tool should span, hopefully span that area better, but yeah. yet to be proven. We're thinking of Maybe rows and columns, a rectangular array. Yeah. I was thinking of, of oh. that, like, like, like on a bigger mirror, maybe you would use more than seven 
uh, Bill. Not. Yeah, I would have liked to make for bigger mirrors more holes. But on the spreadsheet, if you're writing the pro if you're writing a program, you can do it. With a damn spreadsheet, it's, it's very difficult to have more, you know. And that's the limit. And, and Good I, point. I, I yeah. think I'm too old now, but <laughs> it should the stuff I did should be a being in Java. You can program it Java. Yeah. I agree. I, I've been screwing around with this stuff earlier this year. And spreadsheets are just they're they're a poor man's way of doing advanced math. And yeah. you know, there's things like MATLAB, MathCAD, Java, whatever. That we Good, I qualify here. Huh? I qualify here, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I also wanted to ask, um, so uh you had a if you could go back to your slide with your very clean array of dots that that you showed, um it was just spectacular. Yeah. There you go. Right. And when you were presenting this slide, you mentioned how um, it was important. Might have done this slide, but you, it was important for you to get the size of your measurement circle correct and centered, and you could get some variation otherwise. And I know that one source of error in this is if your black state is not truly black and there's a gradient across it. Absolutely. Now, now you got these pedestals riding on a gradient and your centroid can move. Yep. So do you do um, flat fielding and, and calibration and all that in your camera images as you take them? No. No. No, but what we're trying to do is when we do process the film, when we process the image, we work to get that black background as best as we can and to find the image as small as we can. Okay. Yeah. You might be able to do it's a straight subtraction of the, of the background. Uh huh. So let's say the background goes from 580 meters to 38 meters, but your dots are 200 or 120. You could subtract 50. And now everything below. Less than fifty is solid black. I see. Uh -huh. you just got your pedestal. Yes. Right. That would improve things. That might be an even better way to do it. We've done some extensive experimenting with rep repetition on the selection tool and, and getting the same figures. Um, as long as you keep the centering tool centered on the center of mass of the of the dot, it seems to be very repeatable. Yeah, well, and I mean, you can I practice. Recently, did this experiment and just managing your brightness and contrast you can get the background dark enough so that when you move that circle around the center mass of the dot doesn't change by a thousandth of a pixel yeah okay. it's dead pretty, on pretty yeah so yeah. you're so you're doing it in the camera where by by setting your exposure correctly you've got enough contrast that the that the background is just gone are your yeah. exposures 30 seconds no i'm doing um um probably closer to 12 10 or 12. the, the room has to be just ass black yeah right? even an led in the room yeah 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 exactly yeah okay yeah so i i tried flat fielding uh -huh. and it really got me much further than where i was i didn't have the super black room i had all sorts of other sorts, sorts of stray light so that was helping me in particular we uh -huh. had found that on the on my hartman testing on his scope in this driveway with the Sacramento light pollution, that is a serious problem. It throws a data everywhere. Yeah, yeah, Trying yeah. to get that black is almost impossible. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just I'll just throw it out there that if you want to do this, we we probably all have the skills to do flat fielding. Do it. If you you know don't use film, use digital. Take a picture without the yeah. What I did was I took the mask off. Yeah. And I flatted it on the, the return, the whole flooded field from my light source. Then I put the mask on and then I subtracted out that that background and that just killed it. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. There was there was trouble though with edge diffraction. So at the at the edge of the mirror, I got this ring, and so that seventh hole actually would tend to fall on that diffraction band in, in the the after I got done flat fielding, all the dots looked good except for the last one, which was half bright and half dim. 
So I had, yeah. to, I had to trick that one. And I'm, I'm looking for a, that's part of the reason why I'm asking. I'm looking for a better way to get a good flat field or what it is you do. I like that you can just set your exposure, but you have to have a good black room. Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. So yeah. there's another thing. Bill's test, the outer edges of the holes are right on the outer edge of the mirror. Yeah. And on Lon and me, they're in a little bit. Oh, okay. Okay. So you kind of lose that ring out there. Yeah. And if it does go over the edge, it'll destroy the figure. I mean, to destroy your data. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Figure. Even just a little bit. I've right. proven that. Yeah. It just throws it that sensor right off and boom, off you go. Exactly. Okay. So how do you keep the, the camera square to the mirror? Well, that's uh, set up with, a, when you set up your stage the first time and set up your laser and so forth, then you set that axis up, so you're right on axis. So well, on axis is one thing, but parallel is another. Uh, well, I assume you're talking about the uh, the camera plane being yeah, perpendicular, exactly. orthogonal to it. Yeah, and um, so we set that up originally. We we'll take and uh, it's quite a long procedure. Bill and I were uh, Bill alluded to it, but it's a long procedure to set this up. Um, when you the first thing we do is we'll get on axis and make sure that the stage works on axis. And then we'll make sure that it's perpendicular for the camera. And uh, then the set the laser and the laser repeats it. Okay, but so how do you do that perpendicular to the camera? Well, it's interesting because this stage that I built uh, was pretty well aligned. Uh, the machining on it is pretty accurate. So we didn't have any problem with it being, it needed to be adjusted. But uh, Bill has used what they call a three bounce laser check. We'll, <clears throat> you'll send a, a laser through the center of the stage to the mirror, come back to a secondary mirror on the stage, and the third bounce has to fall in the same spot on the mirror. Then you're perpendicular with it. And that's how we verify that. Yeah. They use that on uh, copy machines or, or uh, uh, I forget what they're called, uh, image enlarger machines to align the machine to the table and so forth. When we set my gear up, it took an entire day to set it up. But then when you use it, every time you test it, it's just a few seconds. It was that first setup that was rough. Yeah. Okay, I guess that concludes. Uh, thank you very much for... Yep. Good. Thank you, Lonnie. Um, I'm going to check to see what we have here on the chat, see if there's any questions. Um, oh, da, 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 okay. Thank you, John. I got your presentation. So, all right. We can look at that. We're going to stop the share for now, unless there's any questions out there for anyone watching on Zoom. Um, this concludes the morning portion of today. We will take a an extended lunch break and start up again at 1.30 Pacific time. So again, for those of you who kept trying to, to join the meeting two hours ahead of time, check your uh, time differential with Pacific time zone. All right, see you, see you at 1.30. Hold it Thank you.